Hi and welcome to Fail Lab Lectures. Uh, in this lecture, we will be discussing about the Newton gravitation. Newtonian gravitation is what is the topic, and uh, we will be discussing about uh, many centuries of development, uh, and uh, of course, not the relativity or you know what Einstein had to say about gravity. Uh, we will just uh, mention about uh, the law that uh, or a principle that Einstein at the end of the day uh, expressed uh, after the uh, the print you know the gravitational principle uh, or the gravitational law so to begin with um, the law of gravity is uh, you know one of those uh, forces or the gravity is a basic force in nature so the four basic forces in nature are the strong force the electromagnetism the weak force the gravitational force So the strong force is what that keeps the nucleus together. The electromagnetism is what that keeps uh, an atom stable. That means the electrons are revolving around the nucleus in definite orbits. Maybe not definite orbits, but however they are moving around the nucleus. Atom is um, uh, stable. The weak force is present in radioactivity. The principle of radioactivity is uh, is because of the weak force, it, it all, the force itself is weak. I mean, that, I mean it's a short range force in one sense. Both the weak force and the sh uh, strong force is very short. Uh, and the gravity is the weakest of all the forces that, are that tends to attract any two objects in the universe towards each other. So, uh, this is uh, some of the basic introductions that in for the basic forces in nature. So, we have four basic forces in nature I guess I, I have written okay you might be wondering what this is it's an apple actually uh, with an outer casing colored blue and uh, the inner casing colored green it's a, a variety of apple you know it's not an inner casing again uh, that's how it looks you know <laughs> okay so the apple was an inspiration to the gravity Newton sitting in his uh, or like he was resting under an apple tree in his estate and uh, well under an apple tree if you sit under an apple tree in an apple season you are bound to experience a, a falling apple so the same thing happened to Mr. Sir Isaac Newton in one sense not a Mr. Isaac Newton Sir Isaac Newton then he questioned why and then was born the theory of gravity so Gravity, since it's one of the basic forces, and we understand gravity to a certain extent, it's called as the greatest generalization the, uh, that the human kind has ever achieved. So, gravity is uh, one of the basic forces in nature, as I said, and we understand it to a certain extent. We don't understand it completely, however, we do understand it to a certain extent, and uh, and hence it is called as the greatest generalization achieved by a human mind. However, throughout this lecture I will not be interested about how brilliant we are to deduce such beautiful laws. How uh, I mean, all I am bothered about is how beautiful nature is, how elegant she is to follow simple principles that can be discovered by social animals as such as human beings. Okay? So, what is gravity in one sense is nothing but you know we shall not directly get into the the law of gravity however i shall take you there after some time but before that we shall go back to the times of ptolemy so ptolemy was a scientist again a physicist a very good astronomer in one sense uh, actually he predicted uh, he was one of the one among who predicted uh, that the earth is at the center of the universe and everything spins around the earth it's just like human beings thinking uh, that the whole world revolves around them <laughs> anyway uh, so, so the earth is 
um, you know, spinning around and sorry, everything is spinning around the earth. So that's what it is, and hence it was called as the geocentric centric theory. So geo means the earth, centric means the centered of theory means a law or you know the principle. So the geocentric theory was uh, you know as I said, the Earth was the center of the universe. However, in that time, we knew about some constellations, uh, and uh, you know, thanks to the diagrams that was done, we knew some. The sun and the moon revolved around the Earth. So why, why would somebody think that the entire universe? I mean, in one sense, the solar system was, you know, and the few constellations was the universe, not the universe that I'm talking about today. So. Why would it revolve around the earth? Well, it is because if I stand, as I said that day when I was in the foothills of Himalaya in my first lecture on the law of gravity, you know, I was you know, standing there in, at night, I was doing observation and uh, Venus was uh, well, clearly visible uh, for me, uh, fortunately, and uh, I had my binoculars and I was watching it. and. Well, honestly speaking, there was this um, well, Jupiter after in, you know some time in the mi middle of the night, and um, Orion uh, obviously. So it looked beautiful, and um, well, it was revolving from it was moving from west to east, sorry, east to west. So the important point here is I have enough common sense for to understand or. I think the human mind has evolved so much from that particular point to today that I can understand if the, the sun is moving from east to west, the earth ha is actually rotating from west to east. So I can just you know remember, or you know I can just deduce uh, you know the vice versa thing. Uh, you know uh, in one sense applying Newton's third law of motion again. Um, so well. You know, when I was doing that, uh, I could see I, I had so many other objects in the in the sky, and uh, which I didn't know what it was. Obviously, I don't I don't know all the constellations in the night sky. Of course, I knew some because I love Orion. I love watching Jupiter because the giant planet just spins in in peace, and the three satellites that are visible, one on the up and the two in the bottom. So uh, it's just beautiful for that big planet to revolve around the sun in, in that beautiful peace and harmony that's that's wonderful so um, anyway coming back to the gravity and the center of I mean the earth being the center of the universe well since everything was revolving around me I had an I, could, I was you know sometimes uh, uh, well I could have I mean it's a trick that the universe plays on your mind in one sense that the un entire thing is moving around the earth. Well, I, it is the earth moving around in the entire thing. I mean, not the entire thing, of course, around the sun that we know. So, I think that was one of the reasons why. Of course, it was careful observations. It was careful observations. But it was not that careful. So, the careful observations was done. It was just seen. So, you know, many days back, uh, I had uh, a very good debate with someone. I said mathematics is very, very important to prove a theory. And the person who believed, he, I think he's from the IIT Madras, he finished from IIT Madras and he works in a HMT now. Uh, he said, no, I don't need any mathematics and I proposed a theory uh, on string theory, you know, some, some addition to the string theory or cosmic, something to the relativity, of course. If you don't do mathematics, the first thing is I'm not going to read it. Not me. Many other physicists are going to reject it straight away. Even if the idea is good, maybe the idea is good. How can I prove that something is correct? Because I cannot go into space and do some sort of experiment, and you know, maybe we may able to find and to do an experiment from the mathematics or the equations that you do and solve. But without the equations and the mathematics, how can you? actually even think of doing an experiment 
and we of course the physicist turn now but although we can do that's a very different thing but it's a rare case when you don't have a mathematical equation you're asked uh, you know you, you're asked to do um, a, a experiment and somebody does that it's a very rare case 99 point of the person 99 times a hundred this doesn't happen so one has to uh, you know just think about that so in the same way here if Ptolemy had thought that everything moved around the earth and hence the earth was at the center of the universe well be it. so we know for more than I think hundred years or so we knew that the earth was the center and of course everyone the church uh, which is you know the scientific uh, you know the philosophy as well as the scientific uh, what do you say uh, active places during that time believed that the earth was the center of the universe and why not well let's not go into that however so but thanks to Nicole Copernicus later thanks to his some good observations and calculations he was able to come up with you know a heliocentric theory he said that the sun was the center and the earth moved around the sun and this makes some sense and we know that's the truth so this is the difference between a theory that has some mathematical evidence or background you know the, uh, a heliocentric theory it stood the test of time it stood well how many centuries I mean I'm not talking about any other theory that will be proved wrong tomorrow because the heliocentric theory cannot be proved wrong because, because it's <coughs> so, I'm sorry about that um, because the heliocentric theory itself is the correct one isn't it so thanks to Nikola Copernicus uh, even Galileo was working on it of course but uh, the history of physics believes that Nicholas Copernicus alone uh, independently uh, deduced uh, uh, you know heliocentric theory of course Galileo was against geocentric theory uh, thanks to because Galileo had observed Jupiter Saturn and so many planets in the solar system that it was too difficult to fool him that the earth was at the center of the universe so so some of the facts that the earth moves in a solar system well the sun is the center or you know the focus let's say not the center it's the focus you know we've got to be very scientific here so sun is at the center of, uh, sorry at the focus uh, and the planets are revolving around the sun in orbits we shall see the shape of the orbits and the motion the type of motion and uh, and so many other things and the forces that exist between the planets and the suns and so on afterwards however um, now the galactic the entire solar system stretches up to about 9.3 trillion kilometers in space I think and that's called as the heliosphere it stretches beyond Pluto beyond Oort cloud or root cloud or whatever you pronounce it it is double O-R-T so Oort cloud that's what I say and uh, and there is this belt of asteroid belt even after Pluto so after all this even still the Sun's heliosphere continues the heliosphere is nothing but uh, you know it's a it's an area or uh, a field that marks the Sun's influence it may be the solar flares that reaches uh, that extreme distances it may be the Sun's gravitational field that is you know still present of course it will get weaker obviously as we move uh, thanks to the Newton's uh, formula again uh, so but it will get weaker but however the gravity is still present right right so we shall discuss about when the gravity becomes in zero okay and all later however so will the solar system is, a, is present in a disk of stars and planets and cosmic dust called as a Milky Way so it's an orderly arranged uh, well it's it seems orderly when I look at the night sky you know a Milky Way as if somebody's pouring milk you know the knee the band that is visible when you look actually um, I saw the band when for the first time I mean not for the first time of course I saw it clearly 
when actually I was traveling to Calcutta to do some speech at US Embassy. So then uh, after Andhra Pradesh, I think we crossed into or, or Odisha and uh, so in Odisha after Bhuneshwar, uh, there was a you know a place where nothing was there, you know, it was literally coastal area and uh, it was dark, pitch dark and the train was moving fast but the thing was that the Milky Way galaxy was, you know, the band of Milky Way, that's what we call it, uh, was clearly visible. It was one of those special moments I can never forget in my life. So, uh, however, it looks as if somebody is pouring milk uh, in the night sky, hence it was named as Milky Way. So, um, uh, Milky Way, we are at the edge of the Milky Way and uh, at a distance of about uh, 2.6 into 10 power 9 light years our Milky Way galaxy is very big it's very very big however there are more bigger galaxies like uh, the M74 I believe is bigger like uh, about a billion times bigger than the Sun or, or, or the Milky Way galaxy itself so many times bigger than the Milky Way galaxy so um, However, again, the Milky Way galaxy is also a part of the cluster of galaxies called the supercluster. And the supercluster of the ga galaxy ro revolute around a common center of mass or cent center point called as the great attractor. And the great attractor is about 3 to 10 power 8 light years from Earth. So it's at the other end of the Milky Way galaxy, right? Right. So this is the apple, we'll come back to it later. But now, the next development was the force of gravity, of course, Newton. Newton questioned it and hence he got an answer that this is the sun and this is the, uh, the you know, let's go for the earth and uh, the apple system first we've always taken the you know in the previous lectures when we did the energy we took the gravitational potential energy we considered the particle earth system right so in the same way here we considered the earth and the and the apple system right and writing this i mean it looks really really bad you know It is because, you know, the gravitational, well, uh, Newton's law of gravity can be applied when the distances are enormous and uh, compared to the distances, the radius of the objects that you consider has to be, you know, it has to be small or you know, a fraction compared to uh, the big distances. Look. There is gravitational force between me and the pen. I'm actually attracting the pen, but it is so weak that nothing happens to the pen. Well, we say nothing happens to the pen. The earth is attracting the pen, so if I drop the pen, it directly goes towards the ground. But I'm not going to do that. But you know it does. So there is gravitational force between the Alps mountain that is in the Switzerland, but I'm in India, that doesn't matter. So there is attraction of, you know, gravitational attraction between me and the Alps mountain also. However, it is very weak as I said. So, we are not going to talk much about that. So, the gravity at the end of the day is the weakest force and the proof is all over you. All around you and all over you. So, you don't have to um, go running to some place on the earth to find find uh, the, uh, that the gravity is a weak force. So. Okay, so this is okay. So this is the horizon. The point is the horizon. So the problem is that f proportional to m1 m2 by r square is what Newton came up with. So this is the law of gravity. The law of gravity states that the force of attraction between any two objects is directly proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of the distances having considered that the mass of the objects is or you know the size of the objects is 
uh, a fraction compared to the big distances between them. So, so it doesn't make any sense for me to say that there is a gravitational force or it doesn't make any sense me calculating the gravitational force between this pen and me nor me and the earth but however Newton was sitting under an apple tree so we shall discuss how he was able to solve the earth and the apple system okay this is the earth so the gravitational law for the earth apple system is what we are going to discuss now so the apple uh, you, I mean you can treat the apple as a system you know, because it's very small compared to that of the earth mass of the earth but however you cannot treat apple alone as a system because it's part of the earth right right so what Newton did was he was very clever you know Newton was very clever he's also a genius before Einstein he came up with a theorem and the theorem was called as a shell theorem okay the shell theorem stated a uniform spherical shell of matter attracts the particle that is outside the shell as if all the mass were shell's mass all the shell's mass was concentrated at the center of the shell so that means that the mass of the earth is concentrated here at the center of the earth of course you know that means the shell so all I'm trying to do is I'm trying to calculate the gravitational force between the apple and the the center of the earth rather than the entire earth itself or the shell itself so what I'm going to do is I'm going to erase all and now if I can calculate I apply Newton's laws uh, well you know the radius of the earth and uh, I hope you can calculate the depth of the earth you know and depth to the radius or the center of the earth sorry by using the radius and you put the answer the apple is, uh, is attracted towards the earth, center of the earth at the force of 0.8 Newtons and we know that the apple accelerates towards the earth at 9.8 meter per second squared and that is the value of g and that was discovered by Galileo right right so it is minus 9.8 meter per second squared again remember so the apple is being attracted towards the center of the earth and uh, not you know, then so you are very clever he's very clever you know well he did um, come up with this law so this is called a shell theorem not many people mention this but it was a wonderful idea that Newton did you know but it worked you know he's a great man he's a genius well now I'm taking both apple and the center of earth as a system since the center of earth is you know, like the distances is very large again I can apply the law of gravity again to the apple as a system so that so the center of Earth will be accelerating at uh, 1 into 10 power minus 25 meter per second squared. So that will be the acceleration due to the gravity of the apple. And it is, of course, towards the center, or, or you know, we will not talk about the center of the apple, but of course, towards the apple. So so this is what Newton calculated. So it's not just about the inspirations that inspire you to do the loss. It's also very important that you find out the way to solve the inspiration itself. So this is an example. So Shell theorem plays a prominent role. It's a it's a prominent assumption that Newton made. You know when he said then a uniform spherical shell of matter attracts a particle when it's outside the shell as if the shell's mass were to be concentrated at, at its center right so we saw Newton's dream I think Newton himself did so it's very important you, that you solve your dreams not just the 
uh, the inspirations question. So, um, well, uh, before getting into the mathematical bits, we shall enjoy some of the, you know, the mischievous uh, ideas that were produced in uh, in between. Okay. So, um, well, you know, everybody knows uh, this is the center of the you know, sun. The Earth moves around the sun. Earth moves around the sun. In a circle. Okay, I know some physics. It doesn't move in a circle. I know, I know. But a third grade student or a first grade student would be taught in this way, you know, by telling that the Earth moves around the sun in circles. And the entire solar system is nothing but the big circles that you draw. Uh, you know, uh, concentric circles with increasing radii. So that's how you do. You know, that's a bigger solar system. So the sun itself is also a big circle at the center. So you keep on drawing these, uh, you know, circles and circles and circles and circles. So after nine, ten circles, I, st I still remember one of the biggest circles. I used to do the big circle sun. And then, you know, I used to do, uh, you know, nine more circles or concentric circles with increasing radii. So, uh, well, you know, that was a hopeless thing to do. I hated it. And of course, uh, it's a wrong way to teach physics. But ho however, in the beginning, that, that was the, you know, idea that, that the people had. So the word uh, is somewhere here, and it comes here after some point. You know, the word is here. Look, even though it looks big here, just imagine that it's a point. Okay? Okay. So, we knew, I mean, again, we know how things move in straight lines. You know, the motion in one dimension. So, if I have to move a ball or an earth in straight line, what I do is I apply force in, in that direction. So, the force is applied on the ball, and the ball accelerates in the direction of the force. And we know it from the Newton's law of motion of the Newtonian mechanics that we business and so on. We also know how the bodies move in circles because we've already visited about that also. But however, for a time being, you just forget about that. All right. So now Newton's principle, or the sorry, the inertia the principle of inertia that Galileo deduced says that the body continues to accelerate or move at a constant velocity forever and we don't know why it does but it does so that's the principle of inertia so the principle of inertia if you apply to this the earth can move in a straight line the earth can move in a straight line however the earth doesn't move in a straight line it moves in circle right here after some time say about three weeks the earth comes here not here, right? So this there is a dif distance. If you can calculate, maybe it's just a twentieth of an inch, right? Twentieth of, of an inch is what the distance is, and uh, you know the so it's a circular track. So so why does it happen? Or why does it happen so? Well, it's a big question and the answer came actually in a very, very, uh, you know, funny way. Again, not disrespecting, no disrespect uh, to anyone. However, it's very funny. By this time, we knew that, the, you know, the, well, you know, thanks to Tycho Brahe, people first thought how the motion around the sun takes place. And uh, you know, Tycho Brahe decided to do some observations, you know, record those observations, and uh, you know, he came up with a beautiful uh, well, experimentation. Uh, the results was given to the, the great Johannes Kepler. So at that time, Kepler 
actually believed in Tycho Brahe. So Tycho was an experimental physicist in one sense. So this is what an ellipse looks like. So the, the orbit is not spherical, but it is elliptical, right? So um, it's just like an egg, eggy. So instead of circles, we have replaced it with eggs. So here, you know, the egg, the Earth moves, you know, a bit elliptical, you know, in a sense. So again, the same problem. The you know, the, uh, you know, the orbit was solved. The shape of the orbit was solved thanks to Tycho Brahe. Tycho was a rich man. He owned an island near Copenhagen. And uh, he went to the island. He fitted the island with brass caps with respect to the position of the, of the planets. And, uh, well, he discovered that the, you know, the planet Mars or Mercury uh, Mars, I believe, was off by eight minutes. That means it's not a circle so it was off by eight minutes and uh, you know the the values were given to Johannes Kepler and Johannes Kepler decided that it is too well what uh, the experimental error cannot be this big because Tycho Brahe was a renowned experimentalist he did experiments to the last decimal place it was perfect uh, and uh, Tycho Brahe is known for that. So Tycho, gave, after giving, I mean, Kepler accepted those laws, I mean, kept, uh, I mean those values, and he ex uh, accepted the, you know, the difference uh, in the orbit of eight minutes of Mars, I believe, and then it was corrected, and then that they were able to come up with this wonderful structure called an ellipse. So elliptical orbits is what the planets move around and it formed the Kepler's first law of planetary motion. Right. So the next problem was, since the orbit, the shape of the orbit was solved, so the next problem was, how does the planets move in those orbits? Well, we don't know. If you apply the law of inertia again, the planet, it's easy for the planet to move in a straight line, but it is not easy for the planet to move in an elliptical orbit. So, but however, um, people were satisfied with a funny answer. I mean, funny today, but it's a very serious answer in that time. So, it was that the angels were actually flapping their wings and pushing the earth. Now, uh, what I'm interested here is at this point, you know, again, where the planet is taking a turn. So what happens at that point of time and let's see what exactly happens. So the angels what they do is they flap their wings in such a way that the earth's you know, gravity, sorry, the motion is always directed towards the center. You know where this is going? The centripetal force, of course, you know. So the centripetal force is created, the force is always created by angels, right? So, well, the angels, of course, are not there. Newton said later that the gravity is an attractive force. The force, I mean, the earth attracts something, you know, it's a pull. A gravitational force is a pull rather than a push. But Newton's him, Newton himself said the force is always a push. But later on, the definition for force was changed to be push or pull. Anyway, again, we'll come back to what's the definition of the right definition of force later. However, again, the angels had to you know, flap their wings in such a way that the earth, you know, changed its its uh, course all the time in the orbits. So uh, let's draw a decent diagram now. I'm trying a little bit to draw properly. Well, of course, maybe we shall do it later when we come back to the Kepler's planetary motion. Um, now, uh, since we have discussed about uh, the Newton's shell theorem as well as the Newton's law of gravity, I would like to mention you something else before we move on. If the gravitational force is a vector, uh, G, capital G, the universal gravitational constant, 
It is constant throughout the universe and it was confirmed by Albert Einstein. And many people do, you know, uh, discuss that it may be wrong, but you are very, very, well, you are very, very wrong if you say that the value of G is not constant in the universe because the satellites launched by NASA has con you know, confirmed the value of G and it was discovered for the first time accidentally while finding out the density of the earth by Henry Cavendish. Most of the time this great man Henry Cavendish, uh, a shy figure in, spe in, in the field of physics, uh, is, is never complimented for his discovery at all. That's a very sad thing. When people, teachers teach, uh, even at the highest level they just tend to forget that it was Mr. Henry Cavendish who came up with this beautiful experiment. It's a very difficult experiment to perform. He had to find out the gravitational force between two, uh, you know, bra you know, rings, uh, and uh, which is suspended by using a quartz wire. So uh, it's a very difficult experiment. It was a very difficult experiment to perform, and he had to be precise, just like Tycho Brahe, uh, to to get the right answers. However, we shall move on. So this, so Newton didn't find the capital G. It was found out by Henry Cavendish in 1946 or something. So it was, I mean, actually it was actually discovered by Einstein rather than, I mean, the discovery of capital G by Henry Cavendish was discovered by Einstein, later confirmed by Michelson Marley experiment or Michelson Marley experiment, whichever you want to pronounce. So Newton all he gave was F was proportional to m one m two by r squared was the Newtonian gravitational theory. However, it is called as the greatest generalization ever achieved by human beings because it is famous. Secondly, it is the first time that we understood something about the basic force in nature. Okay, and we understand it, as I said, to a great level, but not completely. So the next. Uh, thing that we head on to is the superposition of gravitational force. Well, of course, superposition also applies of, uh, I mean, to the gravitational force, right? So superposition, if you remember, F net, that, I mean, a single force that has the same effect of all the forces that are acting on the system and the vector sum of all the forces acting on the system. So F1 plus uh, F2 plus F3 plus, plus Fn. So this is the superposition of force. That's how you define the superposition of forces. So the gravitational force is found by dividing the object into small parts because you know, the gravitational force is always found between big bodies, not the small bodies, some gigantic bodies bigger, many times bigger than the uh, earth sometimes. However, earth is also very big, you know, the radius is very big. So the gravitational force, uh, you know, the, the superposition of gravitational force is found by dividing the object into smaller parts, small enough to treat as a particle, and then by using the formula that has been written here, the superposition of forces, uh, you find the vector sum of all the particles I mean the force of the particles uh, and then you get the superposition of the gravitational force. So here actually it is the g-force of the individual particles that you are finding out of a, a body. Okay? So in limiting cases, and that means in some exceptional cases, what, you, what one can do is is actually we can divide the extended object into differential parts, each of mass dm, just like we did when it went in center of mass. So the force, uh, well, you know, the gravitational force on mass dm, the differential mass, is df, right? So then, actually, individual force is uh, well F1 here, it's not the net force, is nothing but integral dF 
right? So this gives integral of df gives the individual gravitational force exerted by a particle of mass differential mass dm. It can only be applied in exceptional cases, not all the cases, but it will be better with the first case and uh, nothing is complicated about the first case, of course. The second is, however, pretty complicated. If the body is an extended object, it's an extended object, in one sense, like a, well, let's say um, a network of uh, international space stations that extends from, uh, like, uh, the star, you know, from Earth to Jupiter, then you know, what you can do is you can um, actually break down, I mean you're not literally breaking down, but of course you can divide the masses such that you can uh, you know, measure or you can treat some part of sta uh, space station as uh, dm and the force is forced by that mass as df, later on find uh, you know, the df for it by the formula integral of df. So you get the force and you add up all the vectorial, I mean all the forces vectorially, then you get a net or the resulting force and the resulting force is a superposition of gravitational force. So the superposition of gravitational force is, you know, it's a same way that it is that individual force that produces the same effect of the system, uh, like on the system, uh, as it is produced by the sum of all the other forces, um, or the, all the individual forces that you are adding up. So, so it's a uh, it is what it is. So the in the formula that we just wrote, F one here is the integral of dm. The integral is taken over entire extended object and we drop the subscript net. However, if the object is spherical or uniform body, then we assume that the mass is concentrated at the center. You know, the shell theorem, that's what you do. Okay? You can, you can apply the shell theorem to the superposition of forces as well, thinking or just uh, you know, assuming that the mass is concentrated at the center of the earth and then you can find out the force at the center of the earth. So you are not actually calculating the net force here in when you are applying this exceptional case of solving with integration. Right. So now we shall discuss about the gravity near the Earth's surface and uh, you know how does the g vary and so on. So gravity near the Earth's surface. So gravitational force near the surface of the Earth. So F is equal to g mass of the earth, capital M, small earth, I mean small m indicates the mass of a particle or something. So r squared is the radius or the distance between the object. So this is what the Newton's law, uh, Newton's law of gravity says. And again, take f is equal to m by ma, you equate both. In this case, ma is is G here, A G because the acceleration is due to gravity, so M A is equal to G M M by R squared. So M M cancels, then you're left with uh, A G here A this is the A G is equal to G M by R squared. So here if you want to find out G the acceleration due to gravity what you got to do is the multiply the universal gravitational constant. Universal gravitational constant is 6.67 into 10 power minus 11 Newton meter square per kg squared. So this times the mass of the Earth divided by the distance or the radius of the Earth squared. So you get the ag or the acceleration due to gravity. So now let us uh, um, study about uh, how the acceleration due to gravity vary. Of course, it has nothing to do with uh, the formula just we wrote. However, I'm going to write this here: G m by r squared. It's a very important formula. 
and very easy to deduce. Okay, so G is a uh, well, almost constant over the Earth's surface. Uh, the value of G actually here is uh, about 9.78 meter per second squared. 9.78, I mean, the value is correct to two decimal places. So people actually take it as 9.8 meter per second squared. We take it, and sometimes you take it as 10. Okay, for the calculation purposes. So, um, however, um, G, this value, 9.78, is less in some locations on the Earth, and it is like fractionally more in in uh, some part of the Earth. Well, it is because of three reasons. The first reason is that the Earth's mass is not uniform. So, the Earth's mass is not uniformly distributed, right? So. Uh, the crust, the Earth's crust, is uh, well um, not uniform, um, and uh, the thickness of the density varies, and, and also the minerals, the concentration of the minerals also varies, and so on. So all these, because of this, the you know, general, let's say, uniformity of mass is well, it's not uniform. Anyway, so that's some is. The second is that the Earth is not a perfect sphere. It's an ellipsoid. People say geoid, you know. It's an ellipsoid. It is stretched at the equators, and it is like uh, what? What do you say? It's a, it's a, it's flat near the poles. So it's stretched near the equators, and it's flat near the poles. So it's ellipsoid. And uh, also, the third important point is that the Earth rotates. Because of this, also there is this problem all right so um, g actually increases when you travel from the equator to either po either of the poles because in the poles you are more closer towards the center of the earth right because as i said the shape of the earth is, you know because of the shape of the earth the poles are flattened, that means the poles are actually closer to the core than the outstretched equators, right? So, uh, hence the G actually is more at poles rather than at the equators. And the second point uh, when I made that, uh, you know, the rotation of the earth, uh, we shall solve a, a pr problem because because of the rotation of the earth you get some kind of a force on all the objects on the earth it's called as a centripetal force right if you are on a rotating body obviously you are moving in circular direction unless you are at po at the poles you are moving in a circular direction right with some radius and at some angular speed that is equal to that of the earth so we shall solve a, a problem which i have done Honest, you know, to just prove about this, right? So, what I'm going to imagine here is uh, this is the word. and uh, well, conditions for that is again, this is the center of the earth, this is a basket or something that is being put on the earth. Uh, and uh, because uh, the, the basket is, you know, the mass of the basket is so low, I'm, I'm going to treat it as a system. And since the earth is rotating, the basket moves in a, a circular path, and this is the r, the radius, or you know, this would be the radius, and I'm sense again, it's the same circle. So again, applying the shell theorem, you should know that. So here again, for the box, or you know, box. So here, the weight of the box is mg. The normal force acting, on, uh, you know, to keep the box on the earth is fn. So there is a balance of these forces, but however, 
the gravitational, I mean there is an acceleration in this direction, right? The boss is accelerating in a in an anti-clockwise direction here. So the acceleration A indicates the acceleration due to the circular motion, the rotation of the earth. So now Fn minus mg is equal to m times this acceleration A. So mag minus mg is equal to m omega squared r. Uh, r is the radius. If you recall, acceleration is omega squared r is nothing but v squared by r, the centripetal acceleration. Okay, so that's the same. So the acceleration is this. So m is equal to a g minus g is equal to m times omega squared r. So m and m cancels. So a g is equal to g minus omega squared r. Okay, so this is a very important reason. Again, so free fall acceleration is equal to the gravitational acceleration. This is the free fall, or this is the free fall acceleration. You, know. you can interchange it. The, the value remains the same. I'm just going to interchange the two so here. Ag. So the free fall acceleration is equal to the gravitational acceleration Ag minus the centripetal acceleration omega squared r. So G is equal to Ag minus Ac. Right? This is the centripetal acceleration. That is, where, I mean, the term that we have used to represent the centripetal acceleration is Ac. So uh, the G minus Ag is equal to Ac, right? Okay, so I hope you have understood this. So that means that the free fall acceleration is equal to the acceleration due to gravity minus the centripetal acceleration created due to the, um, well, rotation of the Earth, right? So that means that because of the centripetal acceleration here, G is equal to A, A G minus omega squared R. Because of this term here, the G value, which is 9.8 meter per second squared, is not exactly 9.8 meter per second squared, isn't it? So the G value is actually decreasing because of the centripetal acceleration of the Earth due to its rotation. Okay, so now it's a very important result that we discussed now. We shall go to the gravitational potential energy thing. Or um yes. Yeah, one more important thing that the uh, I wanted to discuss was the the uh, the gravity inside the Earth. Well, as per Newton's shell theorem, a uniform shell made up of matter or shell of matter exerts no net gravitational force, no net gravitational force on a particle or object that is inside the shell. So. Uh, basically, at the center of the Earth, the gravitational force is zero. That doesn't mean that there is no gravitational force. It means that there are gravitational forces, but they are balanced. Okay? That's what it means. So the statement doesn't mean that the gravitational forces on the particles from various elements of the shell, that means the various elements of the Earth, the iron and uh, you know, the solar elements, uh, is zero, but the net force is just zero. Okay? So that's what we it means. So there were many people discussing that uh, the gravitational force in the center of the earth is zero 
if you cannot do anything as such as you know the gravitational uh, you know if you don't know or if you cannot think about all these kind of things at that particular point of time when you say that the center at the center of the gravity the gravitational force is zero just think about the greatest generalizational uh, law that we have discovered as human being now f proportional to m1 m2 by r squared if r is zero so what do you get or if the force is zero, what, is, what should ha what it should be? So these kind of questions, if you are a very good mathematician, you would put some values to the f, I mean the force, and then you will the gravitational force, and you would decide what exactly is happening at the point. So the gravitational force at the center of the earth is zero. The net force is zero. Okay. Okay, so the next is the gravitational potential energy. As I said, we've discovered, I mean, discussed about the gravitational potential energy in the previous uh, lectures itself when we did energy and the conservation. So the gravitational potential energy is uh, energy stored because based on the position of the uh, body above the Earth's surface under the influence of the Earth's gravitational force. So that is what is the gravitational potential energy. So as we all, um, well, the gravitational potential energy is uh, actually decreases when the distance between the particle and the earth decreases. Well, with the height it increases. So a stone uh, falling from a height of uh, 40 meters will have more impact on you. If it falls on your head, you are more likely to die so then a stone falling from a height of 10 meters that means that with the increase of height you know if you're placing a stone at a height of 40 meters then at that particular point of time the potential the gravitational potential energy is very high and by the time it comes down under the action of earth's gravitational force the potential energy is being converted into enormous kinetic energy and the enormous kinetic energy when it hits the brain the brain shatters into pieces and then you are left with no choice but to die but however if it's 10 meters you might as well survive with a scratch on your head so that's the way it is so the real experiences the real life experiences um, you know is what we are studying in physics that that is the importance of physics actually to be honest so the gravitational potential energy can be uh, given by the formula minus g m m by r so this is uh, the formula for the gravitational potential energy so when is the gravitational potential energy zero it is zero when r is infinity right so at infinite distance actually at distance more than infinity the gravitational potential energy becomes zero so again both the things are not possible uh, for the gravitational potential energy to be zero and uh, you know the, for us to reach a distance of about infinity well, that's I mean like and gravitational potential energy is always negative and uh, with the increase in distance uh, the negativity also increases okay okay I think that's what we had about the gravitational potential energy and uh, well gravitational potential energy again then it is negative and it the negativity increases with the increase in distance again it has to be a finite distance right so what if the system contains I mean the, the formula that I wrote here u is equal to minus g capital M M by R is for a two particle system okay it's for a two particle system what if there are more than two particles? Then u, well, let's uh, say um, for a system of uh, of p, s y s of p, the u is minus of g m one m two by r one two plus g m1 m3 by r13 plus g m2 m3 
by I two three. So, so this is the formula. We, I mean, you can expand it. You can extend it to an, uh, any number of of uh, bodies um, or particles. So U is equal to minus G M one M two by R one two plus G M one M three by R one three plus G M two M three by R two three. Here, uh, important thing is that if it is the masses are like this, M one here, M two here, M three here, somewhere here. So this is R one three. So this is R two three. This is R one two. Okay, this is R one two. So the distances are to be taken in this way. So distance between one particle and particle two. This is the distance between particle one and particle three. And this is the distance of the just the unit vector, the line connect line extending from particle two to particle three. So in in serious physics or uh, in standard physics. It's a. It's just the the value of the um, well the vector is connecting the you know, the position vectors are, are are the distance between the two vectors. So it's not a vector at all at the end of the day, right? Anyway, so the distance is, is what you need to calculate. You have to be accurate, and so you can calculate the gravitational potential energies of of the various uh, particles in the system. So again, defining the system becomes very important and identifying what has to be taken is also very, very important that one has to take care while solving the problem. Now, again, coming back to the same formula, U is equal to minus G M M by R squared. R, the gravitational potential energy is nothing but the work done by the gravitational force. So this is also very important when we discuss the gravitational potential energy is also uh, the work done by the gravitational force on the two particle system. Right? This is what it is. So, if you remember when we discussed in work energy uh, lecture that uh, the work done by a particle is independent of its path. Since the gravitational potential energy is also uh, a conservative uh, energy, it's a con it's a I mean the gravitational force is a conservative force. Hence, the gravitational potential energy is also conserved in the system. Hence, it is also path independent. So it is very important that the work done by the gravitational force is again path independent. Okay, so because based on this, what we shall do is you know, mathematically how we can write the path independence is u delta u is equal to u f minus u i is equal to w. Okay, so delta u change in the gravitational potential energy is also independent of the path because of this you know the work done by the gravitational force is also independent hence. That implies that the change in the gravitational potential energy is also conserved and also path independent. Right. Next, based on this, if you want to launch a rocket, in order for it to escape from the Earth's gravitational force or uh, the Earth's magnetic field, or let's say the gravitational force, it has to have some minimum velocity and speed. It is called as escape speed. So escape speed. I'm calling it as escape speed, but most of the people write it as escape velocity. It is because the escape speed it doesn't matter in uh, depend on the direction of the projectile. You know, you, you may launch it in any direction you want. It doesn't depend on the direction. Hence, it is its speed rather than velocity. So we know that u is equal to minus g m m by r, and the total mechanical energy of the system is conserved. That means that k kinetic energy plus gravitational potential energy, even in this case, is zero. Right? K plus is zero. That means again, you put the equation uh, that implies half m v squared 
minus uh, okay minus g m m by r. You solve for v, you get two g m by r. So two g m by r, two g m by r is to with escape speed of a projectile. So it's the minimum speed. It's not the maximum speed. It gives you the minimum speed with which the projectile has to be launched in order to escape the Earth's influence or you know, into the space. Okay? So the Earth's influence again, uh, we shall talk about what happens when and where and stuff like that, but right now this is how it is. So the escape speed u is equal to minus g mm by r and k plus u that is nothing but the sum of kinetic and mechanical, uh, sorry, sum of kinetic and the gravitational potential energy gives you the me total mechanical energy or the mechanical energy of the system. The mechanical energy of the system is conserved and hence the difference is zero. So half mv squared is the kinetic energy minus gmm by r from this formula. You substitute for v in this formula because uh, k plus u is equal to zero. That means you put it, transfer it this side and solve for v to get the equation. So it's simple and easy. In this chapter, the derivations are easy and it is very important that one does derivations so that to understand how the nature works. So it plays a prominent role in trans, you know, in, in expanding what we know about the history of gravity. So, um, well, when in the Cape Canaveral, when they launch a rocket, they, they launch it at that particular point, the east end, uh, because of the speed of that is produced due to the Earth's rotation, the speed at that particular point of time is about 1500 kilometers an hour thanks to the Earth's rotation. So if you launch at that particular point, it helps uh, you know, the launch, uh, launching a rocket uh, in, a, in, a, in a more efficient way and lesser uh, velocity, escape velocity. Now, yeah, the very important point when I said the gravitational force inside the Earth. Of course, at the core, the gravita net gravitational force is zero. Or the superposition of all the forces acting on a particle at the center of the core is zero. However, when the body is moving from the crust or the surface of the Earth towards the center of the Earth, the in reality, the well, you know the gravitational force of the on the body of the particle increases to a certain depth, and later on it abruptly decreases. So this is very important. Now the gravitational force, in in sense the the g decreases. So in general case, in a more uh, absolute case, the gravitational force decreases as the particle moves towards the core but in reality it increases till certain depth and then decreases okay and I don't know the depth sorry about that so that means that when people go I mean for them for those who are working in mines the elevators they use to get down to the surface of the earth so at cer certain particular points. The, the thing is that they are experiencing more gravitational force on them and the, gra the acceleration due to gravity is more, I mean fractionally more, not like too much. So, um, so this has to be understood in a very sense, pretty, I mean like deep sense and uh, while coming back in the lift, that means that the lift has to exert exert more force to pull them back up to the surface. And again, they're experiencing more gravitational force than they were experienced at the surface of the Earth. So, um, so next we shall go to the Kepler's laws of uh, planetary motion. And uh, we shall discuss about how the satellites move and stuff, and uh, then we shall end the lecture. So the first of the Kepler's laws of motion again.
as I said before, thanks to Taiko Brahi, the work of Taiko Brahi, uh, we have um, a, I mean, thanks to the work of Taiko Brahi, a very great work indeed uh, by him. The, the values were given to Kepler and the Kepler um, you know, turned it into loss. So a very good analysis was done by Kepler, very good experimentation was done by Tycho Brahe. So the Kepler's loss of motion says that the planets move around the sun in ellipses, okay, almost like this, with the sun at the focus. And the sun is not at the center. When you write the diagram, it's all it's wrong if you write it there. Say the Earth is somewhere here, and, and Let's draw a line here, and uh, this focuses two foci. Now I'm going to draw this in the center. So, so this is the end of the orbit. So this is, let's call it as. Uh, RP or PR or whatever you want. This is uh, RA. So uh, the Earth is uh, closer to the Sun at this particular point. So it is it is very close to the Sun, and hence it is called as Perillion and uh, from here to a position say here the earth is quite far hence RA the distance from the sun to the earth is called as Perillion so Perillion is uh, closer to the sun the position of the earth is closer to the sun or you know the satellites, you can use the same thing. So a period is uh, the farthest distance that I have, you know, the farthest distance of separation. Now, uh, you know, this is the, s I mean the first law states that the objects, the bodies, the planets move around the sun in ellipt elliptical orbits with sun at the focus. There are not there are no two suns. This is at uh, one time of the year, say January, and say this is in uh, July or somewhere. Okay, so July and Jan. So just to uh, make sure that uh, you've taken different times here. So now try and clear up the mess at this point. So one more thing that Kepler did was uh, you know very important thing is uh, that you know you draw one line this is also earth say at uh, february february part of the year you join again one more part in say third week of february so the area covered by the planet in three weeks is equal to a okay Again, in the same instant, you have one planet here, again, in, this is July, so this should be somewhere around uh, August. So let's say this is, again, okay, July last week, so this is August second week, la fourth week of July. So the area again here, covered by the, the planet at both the instances is A. That means the area covered by a planet in its orbit. So the area covered is always constant if you measure the area with the same time interval. So time T, T must be sine. Okay, T is sine. So the second law can be stated like that the line that connects a planet to the sun sweeps equal areas in the plane of planet's orbit in equal intervals of time and 
is dA by dP and mathematically is zero. Sorry, constant. Sorry, constant. Do apologize. It's a constant. That means that dA by dT is a constant value and uh, the planet sweeps up equal areas in equal intervals of time. Right? Right. So dA by dT can be calculated with uh, L by 2M. So dA by dT. And calculating the formula. So L by 2M, L is the length of the orbit and M is the mass of the planet, both of which doesn't change much. Mass doesn't change, but the length might vary. But however, we have uh, the Earth, uh, the distance between the Earth and the Sun at about 150 million kilometers. Uh, so it's, but the va again, the value varies. So what ha exactly happens is when the Earth is at, or any planet is nearer to the Sun, it actually moves slower to, and uh, when it is at the, the farther end, it moves faster. But however it does, it covers equal areas and equal intervals of time. So this is what is is very important. Right. So the final law of Kepler's planetary motion. So Kepler's planetary motion third law states that the square of the time period taken by the planetary wall around the sun is directly proportional to the cube of the radius of the orbit or Right, the square of the time period taken by the uh, you know, planet to rotate revolute around the sun is directly proportional to the cube of the radius of the orbit. So um, it can be calculated with the uh, formula 4 pi square by gm. Again, we're going to actually solve this some point at some point of the time in the coming lectures. Uh, right now, cannot derive this, alright? So, so, the next part is is what, you know, the, um, even after the law was given by Kepler, it was still believed that the angels were were behind the planets, pushing the planet in their masses. The square of the period of time is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of its orbit. And, uh, well, uh, the, the, uh, the period in which the planet moves around the sun is irrespective of the eccentricity of the orbit as well as the area sweep also independent again eccentricity is implied in I mean like you know, since it's an ellipse you can however calculate that you know the distance is eccentricity times a uh, which I forgot to actually mention at that particular point of time so the orbit is elliptical and uh, the time period and uh, the And the area actually covered by the the planet moving around the sun so if you take an average of the distance as I said before so the time period is t square proportional to the cube r cube where is the, the square of the period of any planet is proportional to the cube of the semi-major axis of 
edges in the same direction, so the cube on the seven major axis is the cube of the area. Uh, and the time period taken for the body to travel from T1 to T2 is nothing but the cube of this area, the seven major axis of an ellipse of the orbit. So that's how you take, so again, uh, great discovery by Johannes Kepler um, and a great work by Tycho Brahe. Now to the satellites. So, when a satellite orbit the Earth, well, what part does it take? Well, it does take an elliptical part, part, sorry. Um, even for the Plutos, the Uranus, the Neptunes, the Jupiters, and the Mars, the Venus, the Earth, all follow Kepler's, I mean, every planet in the solar system, every other planet in the almost, I mean, I think it is, I mean, like, they believe it is universally applicable. So, but however, let's now just be sure, I mean, because we're sure about the solar system, so the Kepler's planetary laws can be applied to the solar system and is in perfect accordance with the solar system. So, now the satellites, again, the satellites also orbit around the Earth in elliptical orbits. So, both its speeds, uh, which fixes the kinetic energy and the distance from the center of the Earth fixes its potential, gravitational potential energy. Of course, the satellites does have gravitational potential energy, but they do fluctuate periodically because, as I said, there is the aphelion and the perillion uh, even for the satellites when they orbit. So the orbit is not like the, the, the Earth is at the perfect focus or the center of the Earth. So the focus are you know, like they change and hence even the gravitational potential energy as well as the kinetic energy fluctuate over a period of time. So we know that U is equal to minus G M M by R. In order to find KE, what have you got to do? Okay, G M M by R squared, because the total mechanical energy is conserved. And V squared. And what is V equal to? So K can be taken as so potential so it is the relationship between the K and the U is K is equal to G M U by 2R. There is nothing but U by 2. Right? So, kinetic energy for a satellite revolving around the Earth in the orbit is two times the potential energy, the gravitational potential energy of the satellite. So, you have, you have to remember that the GPE, the gravitational potential energy, is due to, it is based on the distance of the satellite from the center of the Earth and the kinetic energy depends on the orbital velocity of the, or the orbital speed of the satellite because the orbital velocity would yield zero because you know, the velocity is a vector, remember? So, um, well, later on, you now calculating the total energy, E is equal to K plus U um, well, yeah, two U minus uh, is nothing but uh, K by two, right? Uh, just equal to since it is just uh, two U minus U, two U plus two K. So K plus two K. However, is is minus G M M by 2 or minus g m m by 2 r minus g m m by 2 r for a circular orbit total mechanical energy circular orbit 
for total mechanical energy is minus GML by 2R is nothing but minus U by 2 one such so anyway um, or it is just equal to that of minus K so negative of the kinetic energy is what is the total mechanical energy of the uh, of uh, the orbit the satellite in the orbit so now for an elliptical orbit of uh, a semi-major axis this is for a circular orbit. What about the elliptical orbit? With semi-major axis A, E is equal to minus G M M by 2 A. It just replies A, sorry, R by A. Uh, a here is a semi-major axis uh, for an ellipse. So it tells us that the total energy of an orbit depends only on the semi-major axis of the orbit and not on the eccentricity E, okay? It's a very important formula because mathematically you can prove from that formula E is equal to minus G M M by 2A that the mechanical energy in the orbit is independent of the eccentricity I mean in case of elliptical orbit. Now, principle of equivalence. So it ends the Newton's gravitation. Hopefully we will never talk about Newton's gravitational gravitation again but again as I said it's the greatest generalization that human being has ever achieved. Now for uh, the Einstein's uh, principle of, of e equivalence is what it is called Einstein's pre uh, I mean like sorry Einstein principle states that both the gravitational force and the acceleration due to gravity are equivalent. Let us see how. Say, you, a man, I'm so sorry to write it in this way, is standing on the earth where, of course, he is at rest, but there is acceleration, I mean, the gravitational force acting on him, and the acceleration due to gravity for him will be 9.8 meter per second squared. So this is one frame. Now let me take a non-inertial frame wherein the frame itself is accelerating in any direction but uh, since the man will be standing in this particular way so it's accelerating downwards and since the person is in a different inertial in a non-inertial frame, in a different frame of reference, then it's inertial here. And yes, I do forgot to mention that any problem that you solve in Newtonian mechanics or Newtonian gravitational theory or Newton's gravity, um, you have to treat Earth as a inertial frame of reference even though it is not. Okay? Okay. So anyway, so this is the inertial frame of reference for a person in the inertial frame of reference the acceleration due to gravity is 9.8 meter per second squared but here again so this is the gravitational force g force for him he is accelerating in downward direction at 9.8 meter per second squared so for him this is the acceleration in this direction but still he feels the same way as this person standing on the earth so like me so for me the gravitational force is 9.8 meter per second squared Right, the gravitational force is 9. Point, I mean, the acceleration due to the gravitational force is 9.8 meter per second squared. But if I'm put in a rocket in in a space and the rocket is being accelerated at 9.8 meter per second squared, I would feel home. That means I would feel the same way as I'm feeling right now, standing on the earth. So this is very important. That's the equivalence principle uh, that Einstein said: that the gravitational force and the acceleration due to gravity is one and the sign. So uh, A and G are equivalent. Sorry, yeah, G and G, small g, or A G, acceleration due to gravity, or the acceleration, uh, um, you know, at 9.8 meter per second squared in any frame is equivalent to the gravitational force experienced on this planet Earth. So, 
Well, there is one more thing that I would like to introduce you to is the fourth dimension. Well, Newton's law of gravity is well, it explains everything in one sense. Uh, it explains the you know, well, quantitatively how you can find out uh, the gravitational force um, and uh, you, how you can find actually the um, well, uh, amount of force acting between the two masses and um, how the force varies and everything can be calculated from Newton's law but it doesn't explain or it fails to explain the correct way why gravity is an attractive force. Well, why can't it be repulsive force? Well, when the same question was asked to Newton, he had no answer. So, for that, this question to be answered, uh, actually, what Newton did was he actually guessed that the force is not just uh, a not just push, but it is also pull. So, well, it didn't work out for Albert Einstein. But however, Albert Einstein. Well, when we when we shall do a separate lecture talking about Albert Einstein, he was not sure because Newton was his role model as he grew up. So, uh, but anyway, so for Albert Einstein, the gravity was a very different force altogether. So the very sun here, a big ball of fire, is what we define sun as. This is the great sun. So what exactly happens is that there is a curvature that is created. In the fabric of space, because of this huge mass, such as the sun. So because of this huge mass, the fabric of space and the fourth dimension, the time, the space, Einstein said both are the same. And yes, they both are the same. So there is a curvature in the space, just like, you know, you should imagine now, if I just, uh, like this. there is this piece of cloth that I'm holding here. Okay, let's, um, so, if I place something on this piece of cloth, there is a curvature in this piece of cloth because of this mass. My fist is the mass, and there is curvature because of the fist, and it creates a depression in the space fabric, the same way it is created here. So, what exactly happens? is that because of this depression created, the earth, which is here, is being pushed by the fabric of space towards the center of the sun. And it is because of the curvature of this space, uh, which is a very small angle, is what is the curvature of the space. The earth is being pushed towards the center of the sun. And this is why the gravity is still pushed, and force is still pushed. It's never pulled. Nobody is pulling anything. It's the entire space fabric that is pushing on everything in this universe, right? So the sp space fabric is what is responsible for the gravitational force, right? So, say there is a star behind the sun. What exactly happens is the space, I mean the depression in the space fabric or the curvature of the space fabric is also applicable to light. So light also bends. So if there is a star behind the sun, you know, the green color one, so the light from this star, what exactly happens is that it gets bent around the sun for an observer who is seeing the light of the star get bent around a huge mass such as sun. Actually, uh, well it does get bent but by a fraction. But if there are bodies as big as the galaxies, the quasars in the universe, then the, the bending of light is also higher. So that means that the light bends more if the mass is more or if the curvature is more. So 
But we shall just make an assumption that the light curves this much, you know, a huge angle. So what exactly this observer sees is, this is only one star, but he sees two stars, here and here, okay? So because of this, bending of light is called as lensing, and it is because of gravitational lensing, right? The gravitational force creates it, hence it is called as gravitational lensing, and this is the outstanding principle in general theory of relativity that fascinates me right from the beginning. So, now, the star is visible from, you know, from two for uh, beams of light and you can see two stars. But in some exceptional cases, if the body is, you know, the galaxies, you know, when compared to quasars are smaller, so if there is a big quasar and there is a, a galaxy behind the quasar and we are observing it, something, a situation similar to this, then what exactly happens is you can see stars, starlight all over. Okay, starlight all over, and this is not the sun; it's the quasar. I'm talking about the bigger, um, you know, mass celestial objects like quasars. So then, if you can see the star all around the quasar, it looks like a, a ring. Okay, so that's called as an Einstein ring. So this star won't be just a star, it will be a bright ring and it is because of the bending of light in all four dimensions. So I mean in three dimensions of course, but it happens in four dimensions, hence. So, anyway, it's complicated for me to explain it right away, but however, um, Einstein ring is a bright ring and the ring is because of the bending of the light. That means the gravitational lensing. So, so actually, this is a very important principle, and uh, it's very difficult for one to find out uh, Einstein's ring. But uh, I heard claims that they have found something. So you might as well Google uh, Einstein ring, and uh, people have actually uh, taken a photograph of an Einstein ring. So it is very difficult to you know, find an Einstein ring in the universe. Um, anyway, um, this sums up our uh, Newton's gravity. It's a very beautiful topic. I've always loved explaining and learning Newton's law of gravity. However, this sums up the Newton's, uh, you know, of course, there is still the light again. There is still the fluid dynamics again that Newton has contributed. Uh, so we shall get back to that later. Uh, for now, it's goodbye from me. And uh, uh, thank you for, for watching. And I hope you keep spreading science. And uh, in the general, th I mean, in the special theory of relativity, we shall discuss about uh, this gravitational lensing and to calculate how, you know, the gravitational lensing based on the masses and how it depends on the masses in detail. Uh, now, for now, it's goodbye from me.